Grab your Bibles. Tonight we're going to be in Psalm chapter 69 through 71, moving methodically through the book of Psalms, and I hope that you're being blessed. Um, a couple of times I have felt like we're getting bogged down, and I've even come to a place where I've thought, well, you know, we, we've been through almost half of the book of Psalms now. Maybe what we'll do is we'll pick up the book of Psalms at, at some future time, and we'll just move on to something else. And it's, it's always at that time that someone comes to me and goes, man, Pastor Randy, the book of Psalms is just blessing my socks off. So thank you. you have, uh, <laughs> you've been the voice of the Lord, those of you who have encouraged me in the book of Psalms. And I'll tell you why. It's just that you know, we've got 150 chapters of, of I, I don't even know how to word it, I mean, it's just the deepest, most incredible portion of God's Word. And I will tell you that there is, this is no easy task. I spend, you wouldn't believe the amount of time that I spend studying for one Wednesday night service because the Psalms are just such deep water. And so I get so much more out of this than you do. I will promise you that. And so continue to uh, send words of encouragement if the Psalms are blessing you. Uh, I'm going to title Psalm 69 through 71, Lord Save Me. And you'll see why these three Psalms all have a common theme, but I'll give each one an individual title. And um, this theme of Lord Save Me, as you've been hearing in the music that we sang tonight, the music goes hand in hand with what, we, what we're studying tonight. We're talking about trusting in the Lord, that He is our strong tower, that He never lets us down during those times of need. And uh, tonight, the Lord is going to speak very, very specifically about something that, that I believe is just really crucial. It's why I wanted the youth in here tonight. Um, when uh, George, our, our Wednesday night youth leader, had to be away on business tonight, and so when he told me that last week, and I had already been studying ahead, I, I said, we're just going to have the youth stay in. We're going to be talking tonight about some things that are really important for all of us. So just real quick, I want to pray one more time. And Lord, we just, we, de we dedicate this time to you. And Lord, people all over the world are meeting in groups like this um, for various reasons. Lord, the Elks Club and, and all of these other clubs. And people are meeting and they've got great social value. And they all go home and uh, nothing's different. But Lord, when the church gathers, Jesus said that where two or more gather in his name, something so, so awesome happens. He said that I am there among you. And Jesus is fellowshipping with us and his spirit is here to teach us. Tonight, Lord, we just ask that we could learn and grow. You are going to speak clearly tonight and we just pray that we could hear your voice. So, Lord, speak that we could do in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 69, we are going to call this Counting the Costs of Christ-like Living. This is going to be an awesome psalm, but I'm going to tell you that it's going to be very, very challenging. Tonight, we need to count the costs of Christ-like living. And so, our introduction... Very similar to so many others. It's to the chief musician. That means it was supposed to be put to music. And it was supposed to be used in Israel's corporate worship services. We sang songs that are very similar to this tonight. It's set to the lilies. And so oftentimes they would take a psalm and they would set it to an existing tune. And sometimes you hear, uh, they, they kind of give Chris Tomlin a hard time about this because they say that if you know one Chris Tomlin song, worship song, you know them all because they're all simple. Um, I don't think it's quite that simple. And then, of course, this is a psalm of David. As we get into the night, we're going to see that we get into a psalm that the author is unknown. But this is what I like about this psalm. There, there's no historic setting given to us. But what is so clear as we go through here is that David is facing some very, very intense persecution for his faith. In fact, the persecution is so strong that he's going to ask God to keep his enemies from destroying him. So he's being persecuted possibly unto death. So this is some very serious persecution, right? You're going to see as we go along that this is a messianic psalm. And so throughout this psalm, you're going to see things that are prophetic of the life and the ministry of Jesus, and we'll touch on those as we go through. Uh, psalm 69 is the second most quoted psalm in the New Testament, second only to Psalm 22, 
And as we go through it, you're going to hear a lot of New Testament scripture, so to speak, within this. You'll go, hey, that sounded really familiar. I, I've read that before in the New Testament. That's because the New Testament authors are quoting Psalm 69 quite often. So verses 1 through 4 sets the scene for us. Notice the first three or four words, save me, O God. That's so important. David is in this position where he realizes, I am in dire straits, and I've got to cry out to the Lord to save me. And he, this isn't generic, like, Lord, the policeman is behind me. Save me. I'm going five over. Okay, I want you to understand this is not that. This is not, oh, Lord, I'm $20 short for my cell phone bill because I went over on my data this month. This is not that. And oftentimes Christians will be like, the devil is really attacking. I can't pay my cell phone bill, right? This is David saying, because I have lived upright and righteous before the Lord, there's people who want to run me out of town and kill me. So this is a little bit different than just some, you know, simple little, gosh, you know, gosh, I'm having a hard time, God, okay? Notice what he says. He says, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. What you need to see here, and this is why it's important for all of us to get a kind of a, a, a high-level overview, because of David's faith in God, because of David's commitment to live upright and holy and completely sold out to the Lord, he ruled the nation as a godly man. He didn't compartmentalize his faith. He didn't say praise the Lord when he was at Calvary Chapel of Jerusalem on Sunday morning and Wednesday night and the rest of the week go around acting like a fool. David lived out his faith. He ruled the nation according to his faith in God and, and that came with a great personal cost to David. And here's a couple of those costs. Israel's neighbors, they despised they despised and they persecuted him. And then Israelites despised and persecuted David. So David was being persecuted from his neighbors. And David was being persecuted from even among his own Israelites. As we get a little further into this, David's going to go through and he's going to say, even my own family kind of wanted to disown me. Now, look at three things that David expresses here. He, he uses a lot of word pictures and that's why it's, it's so tough teaching the Psalms because you've got to dig into these different word pictures, these poetic themes that go through. But notice he says here that the water is up to his neck and then later on he says that the floods were overflowing him. David feels like he's drowning. He, he feels like he can't keep his head above water. Ha have you ever been in a really rough place in life where you feel like you're drowning? You can't keep your head above water. And it's because people are mistreating you because of your faith, because of your, your faith. And this is kind of what David is saying. He says, this, this season of my life, it feels like waves. And every time one wave crashes and I think, okay, this is it, I'm going under. And then I, you know, I paddle and I get my nose up and I get a breath. Just as soon as I take a breath, another, another wave hits me. And I'm just, these waves are crashing one after another. And then notice he says this. He says, I sink in deep mire. He had a sinking feeling. You, you know what that sinking feeling is? We call that insecurity. That's when, when things have been going wrong for so long, when you are being persecuted and you are being mistreated because of your faith for so long that you forget what it feels like to stand on the solid rock of Jesus. It, it feels like your foundation is starting to deteriorate. And then notice the third thing he says. He uses weir, uh, words like, I'm weary. Look at verse 3. I'm weary with my crying. My eyes fail while waiting on God. This is, this is huge. David is telling us that he's experiencing emotional torment during the season while he's crying out to God and God seems to be silent. That is the hardest thing about being a believer sometimes is that God allows us to go through deep waters. He allows us to continually feel like we're sinking and like we're going under and like our feet are not on solid ground anymore. And he does it for extended periods of time. And then he just lets us be there. And we just kind of go, all right, God, 
This has gone on long enough, and as we'll see later in the text, he'll say, maybe it hasn't, because I have a purpose for this, and that purpose has not been fulfilled yet. Now, David's got this terrible emotional torment going on in his heart as he's waiting for God to respond for his cries for help. And now, verses 3 and 4 tell us why David felt this way. This is getting very specific now. He says, those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully. Though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. And so you see here that he was wrongfully accused by people who hated him. That happens to us from time to time. Notice that his enemies were mighty. And David seems to be communicating that his enemies outnumbered his allies. And I don't know if you ever feel like that as a Christian. Sometimes when you're a Christian in a secular workplace and the people are ganging up on you, you begin to feel like the people here that hate me are outnumbering the people here that like me. And then notice a third thing. It appears, he says here, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. As I read that, I know a lot about the culture. You know a lot about the culture. When men went to war in this culture and they destroyed another city, they took all the spoils of war and they took it home and they distributed it among the people or they put it in the storehouse or whatever. And it's as if David's getting pressure from outside the nation and inside the nation to be nice and let's give those Philistines back all the stuff we took from them or something of that nature. David is saying, you know, I haven't stolen anything and yet I'm being asked to make restitution. I'm, I'm asked to restore. Now this gets messianic. Um, if you look at this again, if you'll look at verses, I guess just verse 4 here, You'll notice a couple of things. The nation that Jesus came to save, Israel, they hated him without a cause. In fact, there was a cause. It's because he claimed to be from God, and then he claimed to be God. He claimed to be the fulfillment of their promised Messiah, and they didn't like that. He healed on the Sabbath. He did stuff like that. And, and, but as Jesus looked at it, they hated him for no reason. And, and then they rejected him and they made every attempt to destroy him. And you know that all those times they tried to destroy him, Jesus kind of slipped away from the crowd or whatever happened until the time that the Father set forth when he would go to the cross and he would fulfill the Father's plan. And notice here it says, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. I got to tell you that as I read that, I see the fulfillment in Jesus, that, that we owed a debt that we could not pay, and so he paid a debt that he did not owe, and he did that upon the cross. He still paid this debt so that he could restore us to the Father. Now, here's the application, and this is for the young people, youth, for you youths. I really want you to listen to me tonight. I'm talking to you from somebody who has been on both sides of what we're talking about tonight. Someone who has failed at this and now somebody who has learned to walk in victory in these things. But listen, here's the application. And that is that anybody, whether it be King David in the Old Testament, Jesus 2,000 years ago, or you and I today, anybody who decides that their personal relationship with God is more important than pleasing themselves or pleasing the world around them, that person is going to learn how much of a personal cost that commitment comes at. And this is what we're going to learn in this psalm, is that if you're going to make that commitment, it is going to cost you. And I can't tell you the number of people that I have known over the years who they got bold for Jesus, and then they got persecuted for their faith, and they hightailed it, and they're to this day not walking with the Lord, not enjoying fellowship with the Lord. Making a commitment to walk with the Lord comes at a great personal cost. And so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to be reminded that there's two ways to go through life. And I want you to turn, if you would, to Proverbs 29, verse 25. We're going to use this as the guide for the rest of the evening. This one verse will give us guidance through the rest of the psalm. Proverbs 29, 25 I'll give you a second to turn there. And what we're seeing here is that there are two ways that we can go through life. 
The first is found in the first sentence. Solomon says that the fear of man brings a snare. This is really interesting. It, Solomon is saying that if you're going to go through life as a man pleaser, if every decision that you make is made so that you can please people around you and so that people around you will like you and they'll get along with you and they'll say nice things about you. He says that kind of an attitude is a snare. And it's interesting because this word snare in the Hebrew, it describes a tool that's used to trap wild animals or birds. Right? It can be like a noose and you would put it out there and when an animal sticks its head in, you know, you would pull it. Now you've caught this thing. It can describe a hook in which you would catch a fish or a snare in which you would catch a bird or a rabbit or something like that. And the whole idea is that Solomon is communicating that if, if you live your life as a man pleaser, you have been snared by the enemy. You have been taken captive. He's bringing you now against the will of God to live as a captive. Let's be honest. How many of you have ever lived as a man pleaser? Is that not a, a jail? Is that not a prison? Every time someone comes up, who's your favorite football team? Who's your favorite football team? Well, I like the Raiders. Well, I like the Raiders. Well, I like the Steelers. You like the Steelers. Are you kidding? They haven't won a game on right? Well, no, no. Who do you like? Okay. What's your favorite food? What's your favorite food? And this is what happens after a while is that people, they, well, what, what religion are you? Well, what religion are you? Well, I believe that all roads lead to heaven. Well, yeah, I kind of believe something similar to that. You know, anything not to make waves. You know what? That is a snare. You're living in a prison of man-pleasing. And then you know what happens? Those men, those people, the, the kids at school, whatever it is, they're going to turn on you in a heartbeat. They will turn on you first chance they get. You want to know why? Because they're man-pleasers too. They're looking for someone to please, and when the other person they're trying to please doesn't line up with the way you're trying to please them, you're on the outs. Look at the rest of the verse. But, here's the transition, whoever trusts in the Lord as opposed to being a man-pleaser, whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Safe. Listen, I was a Christian, a committed Christian, working as a mechanic in a Toyota dealership, right? I mean, that's a step up from a used car salesman. No offense if that's what you do for a living. <laughs> or a lawyer. Or, oh gosh, I'm really going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> Listen, I used to see mechanics that I worked hand in hand with every day doing the most underhanded, illegal, wrong things just to make money. When I decided I was not going to be a man pleaser, I was going to please the Lord, that I was going to trust the Lord, there was nothing safe about that. That was like stepping off a cliff into the unknown. Every day, walking into that shop, just wondering who was going to just shred me that day. You know what they used to call me? They called me Reverend Randy, and it was not a term of respect. I would walk into a group of people, and they would be telling a joke, and all of a sudden, you know, it would just go from vulgar to more vulgar. The whole idea was, let's just, let's test this guy. Let's see if he's going to give in. Let's see if he's going to compromise. You know, then I became the butt of the joke. I became, you know, the one persecuted. And there's nothing safe in this world about being one who pleases God. But you're safe in the arms of the Father because in the midst of how you're being mistreated, He's got your back. The person that you're trying to please, if you're a man pleaser, do they have your back? They don't have your back. Jesus has your back. And so turning back, if you would, to Psalm 69, David's commitment to please God instead of men it came at a great personal cost to him. And each of us in this room that decide that we're going to be God pleasers, we need to remember that that comes at great personal cost. And you better count that cost because if you don't count that cost, you're going to be caught by surprise. And you're going to come home from school or work one day and go, do you realize that the world doesn't like Christians? Really? You finally got tuned into that. We got to be ready for it. So the next thing that David does is he shares two personal concerns with God. He's praying, or he's turning this into a song. And I want you to notice here in verse 5 the first concern that David shares with God. He says, Oh God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are not hidden from you. 
This is really cool. I love this. I love the Bible because the Bible doesn't hide the truth about its characters. David comes along and he says, Lord, I am committed. I am sold out. I'm living my life for you. I'm ruling the kingdom according to your word. But Lord, personally, every once in a while, I mess up. I am a human being and my old nature occasionally kicks in and I lose my temper in a staff meeting or out on the battlefield. You know, I'm yelling and screaming and get over there and kill those guys, you idiot. Oh, oh so sorry, in Jesus' name, you know, something like that. And David goes, I mess up. And he says, I mess up a lot. In fact, I think David would really agree with James. Remember chapter 3, James said, we all stumble in many things. And David is saying to the Lord, I'm one of those people who stumbles. And here's the problem, Lord, is that I live for you, but sometimes I stumble and I don't want the people around me to be hindered by my stumbles. And, and so notice verse 6, let not those who wait for you, O Lord, God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. I love this. David says, I'm not the only committed Christian in the kingdom. I'm not the only person who's sold out for the Lord and living for the Lord. And every once in a while, I do a stupid thing and people look at other people around me and they go, I thought your boss walked with the Lord. He says, I don't want those people to suffer because of my mistakes. And you know what's really interesting about this? David just lays it out. But I would add to this if I could, because I think Scripture teaches us that we have a responsibility to be very careful how we live before the world. Wouldn't you agree? We have a really strong responsibility to encourage and build up the body of Christ. So if you work with other believers, don't be the one in the group that gives the rest of the people that you work with or go to school with ammunition against the Christians. Don't be the one that when the other Christians aren't around slips into compromise just because you don't want to, you know, you want to be a man pleaser, so to speak. You don't, you, wanna, you don't want to draw attention to yourself, but you don't realize you're drawing way more attention to yourself when you as a committed Christian decide that you're just going to compromise in front of those other people who aren't believers. And then what happens is the entire group of believers are kind of going, wow, we're getting a bad name here because of one guy. I used to hate working in a, a secular workplace when people would say, I'm a Christian, and then other people would come to me and go, that dude can outdrink a sailor and still come to work the next morning, you know? And it's like, well, what kind of a Christian are you? And, and David is saying, don't be like that. Look at the second thing David's concerned about. He says, let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel. This is really awesome. He says, Lord, I'm going through some deep waters here, and I'm about to sink. And I don't want the other committed believers in the kingdom to look at me and get discouraged. I don't know if you've ever been, you know, sharing life with another believer who's just really going through it. And every time you turn around, you're like, hey, how's it going? Well, you remember my car got stolen? Yeah, we were praying for you. Praise God we got it back. Oh, good. And then we totaled it the very next day. You know, oh gosh, are you okay? Well, yeah, I got like four broken bones and I had no insurance. And, you know, and you're just like, all this is going on in your life? Do I really want to be a Christian? Because like you seem to be so sold out to the Lord and all these trials keep coming your way. David is saying, don't let the other people in my life get discouraged because what I'm going through. And this is where, this is the turning point. This is where David says, I'm going to conduct myself in such a way that everybody who watches me, the non-believer and the believer, they're going to go, that's how you walk with the Lord in the midst of a trial. And that's where we're going. And so beginning here in verse 7, David's going to start specifically talking about the personal costs that accompanied this persecution. These are the things David was facing. And remember, this is real persecution, okay? And if you're facing persecution, this psalm should really minister to you. He says, because for your sake I have borne reproach and shame has covered my face. And, and, and verse 7 is the key. This is so important to understanding the entire psalm. He says, for your sake I have borne reproach. For your sake my face has been covered by shame. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching. And he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for obnoxiousness sake. Amen? He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for self-righteousness sake. 
He said, blessed are those Christians who are persecuted because they act like total fools in front of the rest of the world. What did Jesus say? He said, blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness. And that's what was going on in David's life. And oftentimes people will come and they'll say, you know, I'm just really facing persecution. I went and told this friend of mine that he's dying and going to hell and now he doesn't want to hang out with me anymore. That's not righteousness sake. That's called bad evangelism. That's called lack of love. That's called no tact, no filters. You need to go back to the school of evangelism, right? You, you can't walk up to somebody who doesn't know the Lord yet and go, you're dying and going to hell and think that they're going to go, Brother, I love you. Thanks for leading me to Jesus. If they persecute you, you are not being persecuted for righteousness sake. You're being persecuted for lack of love or some other thing. And what David is saying, he said, this is so important. I'm being mocked. I'm being insulted. I'm being rejected. But it's because I have chosen to live upright and holy before the Lord. I wonder if, if, if David was being persecuted not so much for his words but for his actions. And it's interesting because now verse 8 tells us that this persecution came from a very unexpected place. And there's some of us in this room who can really relate to this. He says, I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. So David's faith in God, David's conduct as the king ruling righteously caused his fellow countrymen who should have loved God the same way he did to persecute him. And then also those of his family, his mother's children, they persecuted him. And this is also messianic. You remember when Jesus began his ministry, he was teaching at a house and they came to get him because they thought he had gone off the deep end. And his mom and his brothers came to kind of take him to the loony bin or take him home and tell him, hey, you know, we've got a psychologist waiting to figure out what's going on. You have this Messiah complex and we didn't raise you that way, you know. And Jesus said, you know what Jesus said, right? The people of his hometown, he goes to Nazareth where he grew up and he begins teaching. And the scripture says he couldn't do many miracles there. Why? People didn't believe in him. Jesus experienced these same things. And then notice verse 9, because zeal of your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. I also made sackcloth my garment. I became a byword to them. Those who sit in the gate speak against me, and I am the song of the drunkards. And this is what David's communicating. And I don't know if any of you have experienced this. I experienced something like this, okay? When I was doing illegal things and immoral things, and I was partying and living wild and living in total rebellion to God, I got along with all my siblings really well. Really well. When I got radically saved, and I was sold out to Jesus, and I was committed to the church, and I was involved in fasting and prayer and ministry and everything else, I became the white sheep of the family. Many of you have experienced this. That's what David is saying. But notice a couple of things that he brings up in here. I like this. Verse 12, those who sit at the gate speak against me. Listen, those who sat at the gate were supposed to judge the nation according to God's word. He's talking about like what we would call the pastors and the leaders and the politicians and the people who are supposed to lead. He said, even they're persecuting me. And then check this out, this last part. I am the song of the drunkards. The drunks, the people who are sitting on the street are singing songs about me. That's how bad David was being persecuted. Hey, did you hear that new song about the king? I'm on the God squad, I'm on the God squad, ha 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 ha, right? You know, you can just imagine all the drunks getting together. Hey, I wrote a new one about King David and his love for Jesus, right? And David's going, man, I'm walking through the streets of the city that I lead. The elders of the city don't respect me. The drunks of the city sing songs about me, and it's all because of my faith. And you know what I bet David did? I bet deep down inside he said, I'm doing something right, but I didn't realize it was going to be this hard when I did things right. Now notice, this is messianic. There's two messianic themes in verse 9. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up. Remember after Jesus cleansed the temple of the money changers and the merchants and all that, 
and he made a whip of cords and he drove everybody out, drove the animals out and all that, his disciples remembered and they quoted this verse. And then notice the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Jesus taught his disciples something very clear. He said, there's going to come a time when men are going to hate you and they are going to persecute you. They're going to imprison you and they are going to kill you. And Jesus said, you need to understand one thing. They're doing that because they hate you and they hate you because they first hated me. And so this is completely messianic. And David is saying the same thing. He's saying, it's not really me that they hate. They hate the fact that God is alive and working in my life and they don't love God. And they're going to mistreat me. And you know what? Everybody in this room, if you decide that you love God, if you decide that you're going to do life God's way, if you decide that you're going to live righteously instead of obnoxiously, <laughs> you're going to suffer. You are going to suffer. I wish I had time tonight to tell you the stories of how I was mistreated in the Toyota dealership by the management until we got a new manager. And one time he pulled me aside and he said, it seems like God is really blessing you here. Or no, he said, it seems like, like you're doing really well here. And he says, we know why. He was a born again Catholic and he treated me well. But until he became my boss, things were not so great. And so verse 21, we're jumping ahead for a minute. Verses 21 and 22. I, I want you to see the zenith of their mistreatment of Jesus, and then we'll talk of the messianic fulfillment. It says, they also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Let their table become a snare before them, and their well-being a trap. This is one of those verses that we all understand. I'll, I'll talk about the messianic fulfillment. Remember while Jesus was on the cross at a time when he really needed somebody to minister to him physically? He just needed a little bit of nourishment and a drink of water, so to speak. What they gave him was gall. They gave him a poisonous substance. They gave him vinegar. Remember that? And he, he kind of avoided it. But Speaking of David, the Hebrew words in this sentence paint the picture of friends and family bringing a meal to a person who's in mourning. So, so I don't know, you know, when, when somebody loses a loved one and the, the church and the family, you know, they, they come together and they bring a meal or something like that. We come to minister love to a person who is just in a deep, dark place. David says, I'm in this deep, dark place. And you know what they brought me? They brought me a poison sandwich and they asked me to wash it down with a glass of poison. That's in a sense what David is saying. And, and you see how badly David is being mistreated. In verses 13 through 18, now begin to teach us how David responded to this persecution. How many of you think that he got out his 12 gauge sawed off shotgun and went a hunting? How many of you think he wanted to at times? Okay, but I want you to see, this is so important. This is how David dealt with persecution. And this is, this is gonna require that we dig deep because this is getting out of our flesh nature and really walking in the spirit. Verse 13, but as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. Stop. Someone shout out. How did David deal with persecution? Shout out louder. Prayer. David prayed. David didn't talk about them. He didn't gossip about them. He didn't post on Facebook. He prayed and he wrote Psalms. He says, as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. In the acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of your mercy, Hear me in the truth of your salvation. Now, I want you to notice four words here in verse 13. He, he talks about prayer and then the word hear. During this time of intense persecution, David prays and he asks God to hear him. And I want you to notice what he prayed for. He prayed for mercy and he prayed for salvation. He needed to seriously be saved. You and I pray for salvation and God forgives our sin. David was praying that God would literally save his life, that they were trying to kill him. And he says here, verse 14, Deliver me out of the mire. Let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up. And let not the pit shut its mouth on me. Hear me, O Lord, for your kindness, your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. 
Hear me speedily. Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. Do you feel David's pain? David's saying, I'm being persecuted, I'm being mistreated, and now I'm just going to cry out to God. And I want you to notice a couple of things. He kept saying, Lord, save me speedily, right? Don't you just love it when God saves you out of something quickly? Has that ever happened? I know that deep trials in my life, they don't last a day. They don't usually last a week. I don't usually get away with a month. Seems like deep trials in my life go on for a long time, and I want to point something out. This is a beautiful prayer. This is a great prayer. But look at verse 13. He starts talking about the acceptable time. He keeps saying, Lord, help me, but do it in the acceptable time. David understood something that you and I want to ignore. We think that being under the new covenant, being under grace, means that we're never going to suffer, that we're never going to go through a tough time. But David understood something. He understood in his situation that persecution led to prayer. And then prayer led to David being right in the middle of God's will. But this is what we don't know right now. Was it God's will for the trial to stop quickly, or was it God's will for the trial to go on for an extended period of time? Look up at the screen for a minute. Peter's going to give us some insight. Peter was talking to Christians that were suffering intense persecution. And he says here in 1 Peter 5.10, But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Let me say that again. After you have suffered a while, may God perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. I want to talk about the application for that for a minute. Anybody who's ever suffered persecution, I hope this speaks to you. If you are a person who is or who has been persecuted, God has a very, very specific purpose behind this trial called persecution. He's, he's doing something. He's teaching you something. Persecution starts and we immediately cry out to the Lord. We say, Lord, help, right? And when the help doesn't come within a day or two, all of a sudden, we're mad at God. We're mad at God's people. Notice this. Look at this. Reproach, verse 20. Reproach has broken my heart. I'm full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. I looked for comforters, but I found none. Do you realize that that was God's will for David? It was God's will that during this time of suffering that people weren't coming up going, it's okay. One day Paul's going to write this verse called Romans 8.28. And it's all going to work out for good, David. Let me take you to the movies, right? When we're suffering and we're going through it, so often we get mad at people that don't comfort us. We get mad because everybody's not slobbering all over us because we're going through some trial. And God says, do you realize it's me causing the phone not to ring? Do you realize it's me speaking to some of those people in your life, asking them to back off a little bit because I am trying to do something? Look at the screen. God says, in the midst of a trial and a persecution and a tough time, I am trying to perfect you. I am trying to establish you. I'm trying to strengthen you, and I am trying to settle you. And I'm going to be bold here, folks, because this is what happens to me when I'm going through a tough time. I love a good pity party, don't you? I just love to sit down and go, nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go back to fixing cars. They don't talk back. If I strip a bolt, you know, if I leave oil out of it and I start it and the thing dies, well, we just take it to the junkyard. People aren't that way. And we hurt. And we have such high expectations of each other, like we're the Savior, we're the Holy Spirit. Listen, Peter and David together are telling us something tonight. 
persecution and trials and suffering are sent into our life to make us what God wants us to be. The church is supposed to be strong and tough and we're supposed to be world changers, but <laughs> somebody at church, they didn't say hi to me. I'm not going back. In fact, I'm going to become a Muslim or a Mormon because they're nice, right? Think about the way we act sometimes. I really like David, man. He says, you know what? In the acceptable time, God is going to come to my rescue. And until then, no one's coming to rescue me. Man, those are hard words to say because you know what? I'm facing some trials right now. And sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm laying there just thinking, I sure wish that someone would call me and tell me everything's going to be okay. And there God is screaming at me in three in the morning, it's going to be okay in the acceptable time. Like, can someone else call? <laughs> can a human being call and just lie to me and say it's going to be okay tomorrow so I can at least go back to sleep? Right? And, and the Lord just says, listen, I got this under control. What time is it? Oh, we're fine. Listen to me, okay? If you are in a season of persecution, if you're in a season of suffering of some kind, God has a very specific lesson for you to learn. God is allowing this in order to perfect you, to establish you, to strengthen you, to settle you. So, listen, our prayer life needs to change. We have to stop praying for the trouble to stop. We have to stop praying for the persecution to go away. We have to stop praying God to send people to comfort us. We don't need people to comfort us in the midst of our trial. Sometimes what we need is to go through the trial trusting in God and asking him, how are you going to perfect me and establish me and strengthen me and settle me? And God says it's going to go through some suffering. And it's going to happen for whatever period of time I've predetermined for this. So I think we need to start praying that we would begin to tune into what God is trying to teach us in the midst of the persecution and the suffering. And now David's prayer turns imprecatory. I love imprecatory prayers. I, I'm not allowed to pray them under the new covenant, but I sure love reading them in the Old Testament. Verses 23 through 28. He's invoking God's judgment. Check this out. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see, and make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate. Let no one live in their tents, for they persecute the ones you have struck. In other words, I'm already suffering and they're coming along and they're adding insult to injury and, and they talk of the grief of those that you have wounded. And iniquity and they add iniquity to their iniquity and, and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. Wow! <laughs> you want to talk about a guy who's really, really hurting. You know what he's basically saying? Lord, I want you to look at the way they've treated me and others like me, and I want you to pay them back, and then if they repent, I don't even want you to forgive them. I want them to all go to Sheol, not to heaven. Even if they... Nope. nope. Now, now, there is something here. You know, I, I think we can learn something from this. I think a lot of times we spend a lot of time praying for people who are completely unrepentant. And I think it's good to mention them in prayer and to pray for unrepentant people, but I wonder how much time we waste praying for unrepentant people when we should be praying about the work that God has us to be doing. And David just basically says, listen, God, you see what's going on. You deal with them. And then notice David's closing words, and I think that this is a lesson kind of how to face persecution. He says, yes, I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me up on high. I just love this. He says, I am suffering, God. I'm suffering persecution. But God, in the midst of this persecution, I choose not to lose the joy of my salvation. I choose instead that I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to have a nervous breakdown. I'm not going to quit, you know, worshiping you. I'm not going to abandon my faith or abandon the church or anything else like that. God, I'm just going to keep pressing on. I am poor. I'm sorrowful. But Lord, your salvation sets me on high. Nehemiah was talking to the people rebuilding the city and he said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. 
The joy of the Lord is our strength. Verse 30, I will praise the name of God with a song. And I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Can you imagine David writing a song? Thank you, Lord, for letting me suffer. <laughs> this also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bull, which has horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad. And you who seek God, your hearts shall live. Notice David says that he is going to continue praising God. Trouble comes along. He says, I'm not going to quit praising God. I'm not going to quit meeting with God's people and coming to corporate worship. We're going we're gonna to worship, right? God doesn't want us to have a spiritual blowout when trouble comes into our lives. And the second thing here that we just saw, verse 32, David says this, the way that I handle this persecution, the way that I handle this trial, I am going to strengthen my brothers and sisters. You who seek God, your heart shall live, he says. And then he says, for the Lord hears the poor and does not despise his prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah, that they may dwell there and possess it. Also the descendants of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. I just see the same message that James has been teaching us on Sunday mornings. James says, to count it all joy when you face these things knowing that these things are going to strengthen and perfect you. I, I also see hope in the future. David says, this too shall pass and we'll move on into a glorious future. So I think one of the things we've taken away from James, and now David teaches us the same thing. He says that in Christ, we don't have to be a victim. We can always live as a victor, right? No matter what's going on around us. Now, Psalm 70, we're going to call this God be magnified. This is the second time in our study of the Psalms that we come to a Psalm that is repeated. Uh, within the exception, or with the exception of just a few minor word changes, Psalm 70 is virtually identical to verses 13 through 17 of Psalm 40. In other words, we've already studied it. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to call this, let God be magnified. I'm going to read through it and we are going to move on. He says, make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Let them be ashamed and confounded who seek my life. Let them be turned back and confused who desire my hurt. Let them be turned back because of their shame who say, aha, aha. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. And let those who love your salvation say continually, let God be magnified. But I, I'm poor and needy. Make haste to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O God, do not delay. The only comment I'm going to make on all of this is we got to the end of the book of Revelation recently. And as John looked at the coming time of, of trial and tribulation upon the earth, he just looked and he said, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And I see the same thing right here. David is saying, lots of trial, lots of trouble. Lord, come rescue me. And in Psalm 72, and we will go through this quickly, we're calling this the faithful God. How many of you know that God's faithful? Betty Ann, are you here? Yeah. Betty Ann, every time we talk with Betty Ann recently, Betty Ann will go, hey, can I just short share a quick story about God's faithfulness? It just for weeks and weeks, every time I talk with Betty Ann, there's this story of God's faithfulness. This is really cool because we're going to call this the, the faithful God. There's no introductory information as the other Psalms have had. We have no historical setting. We don't even know who wrote this Psalm. What we do know comes from the first verse. Notice the psalmist says, In you, O Lord, I put my trust, and let me never be put to shame. Wasn't that a great introduction? God, I trust you, and I realize that as long as I trust you, I will never have to worry. I'm never going to be put to shame because you're, you're faithful. And the psalmist is going to talk about God's faithfulness in the past and the present and the future. And so notice, deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong refuge to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandments to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O oh my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. The psalmist is saying that because God is faithful, that all of us, you and I and he, can trust him at all times and all circumstances. And I just want to point out two things that he referred to in verse 3. He, he refers to God and he says, you are my strong refuge, you are my rock and you are my fortress. What the psalmist is saying is that I know, God, that you're bigger than my troubles. 
No matter what I'm facing, you are bigger. And so, I want you to notice, he says, I will resort to you continually. And the psalmist is saying, you're huge. Trouble continually comes my way. But I'm not going to turn to anything less than you. I don't need drugs. I don't need alcohol. I don't need comfort food. I don't need illicit relationships. I have you, God. And to you, I'm going to flee. All of those other things are going to lead me to shame. But you, O oh Lord, you are going to sustain me. And he's going to explain now why he has this confidence. Look at verse 5. For you are my hope, O oh Lord. You are my trust now from my youth. By you I have been upheld from birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall continually be of you. This is so cool. He looks back upon his life and he says, I can see that from my mother's womb, you have been taking care of me. You have sustained me. You have continually cared for me and I am going to praise you you for that. And, and this is really cool. I have a similar testimony that the psalmist is sharing here. The psalmist is looking back from, from some future, from some point in his life where he's much older and he says, as I look back, I see God's hand on my life from my mother's womb. I look back and I see that God brought me into a family where my mom loved the Lord. And my mom taught me about the Lord and taught me morality. And then it came a time where because of a relationship of my mom's, her best friend, I met Jesus and I was brought into the family of God. And, and then even when I went astray for many, many years, I can look back and I can see the hand of God on my life bringing me back, and this is going to blow your mind, protecting me even when I was doing stuff that God told me not to do. Now this is not for you guys, that was not a go try this. Don't try this at home. But I can tell you that there were times where I was so rebellious and God protected me from something that would have imprisoned me for probably 25 or 30 years. And God caused the eyes of a policeman to be blinded. And I still rebelled against God for a period of time. But when he brought me back, look at verse 7, I have become as a wonder to many you are my strong refuge. This, this word wonder means a, dis, a special display of God's power. If you went back to 1985 and you talked to the people I went to high school with and you said, where will Randy Lucero be in the year 2018? They would say prison or dead. One of those two, you know. And you know what? I look back and I am a wonder. I am a special display of God's power. Look at what I do. He was probably voted most likely to burn his brain out by the time he was 20 years old. And yet the Lord has taken my life and has transformed me. He's made me a preacher of the gospel. It's just an amazing thing. He says, let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. Since the time that I came out of that lifestyle, I've been a worship leader. And I've used the life that God has given me to lead God's people in worship, to tell them with the testimony of my mouth how he has saved me from so much rebellion. He says, let my mouth be filled with your, your praise and with the glory all the day. Stop, time out. What do you talk about? What do you talk about all day long? If we popped in on you at work, if you popped in on us here at work, you would flip out. <laughs> we have so much fun here at Calvary. But every once in a while, I walk out of my office and I go, can you guys please quiet down? I'm trying to study. I'm trying to prepare a message for tonight. I think they're laughing and joking, but they're just, they're enjoying the Lord. What do you talk about all day? Is it the Lord? Is it your testimony? Is it what God has saved you from? Or you get up in the morning and go tell everybody at work, my life stinks. It's a great testimony. I'm sure they're all coming to Jesus. Go to high school and say, my parents are jerks. It's a great testimony. Yeah, your, your friends are all going to get saved and be here on Wednesday nights with you. David says, man, God has saved her, whoever the psalmist is. And he says, I'm just going to proclaim it. He says, do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. Amen. 
the age of 51, I'm looking back and I'm going, Lord, I think I'm really close to this verse. But this is what's happened. He, he's an older man now, and we're about to see he's sick. The psalmist is sick. He's feeble. He's weak. And his enemies are looking on and going, now's the time to pounce. And notice, my enemies have speak against me, and those who lie in wait for my life take counsel together. They say, God has forsaken him. Pursue and take him, for there is none to deliver him. There used to be a time where, where people looked at, at older folks as a, not a burden, not like that old dude over there. Go ask that old dude. You know, People looked at gray-haired people, at elderly people, as a gift. God has given us this person with experience to, to guide us and to, to lead us. And, and now people look at older people with such disrespect. And in this, you got a guy, this psalmist, who's sick and he's older and his health is failing, and his enemies are looking on going, now's the time to pounce, let's take him out. Verse 12, O oh God, do not be far from me. O oh my God, make haste to help me. Let them be confounded and consumed who are adversaries of my life. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor who seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your salvation all the day, for I do not know their limits. I think the psalmist is saying, the people around me think I'm old, weak, and I'm an easy target. But Lord, I'm going to let you worry about them, and I'm just going to devote myself to proclaiming your praises and testifying who you are. Verse 16, I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, of yours only. O oh God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also, when I'm old and gray-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me, until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. Also, your righteousness, O oh God, is very high. You who have done great things, O oh God, who is like you. I just got to tell you what I see here. The psalmist is older. He's sick. He's feeble. And he feels like he's not going to make it to fulfill the call that God put on his life. He, he is one who is teaching the next generation how to walk with God. And he says to the Lord, I'm not finished. I'm looking at my kids and grandkids and I'm looking at the people that I have an influence on. And Lord, my job isn't done. I am not done. And so he asks God for the strength to fulfill his call. God, I, I want to go out you know, I want to hit the finish line at a full pace here. There's a couple of obstacles. Look at verse 20. He says, You who have shown me great and severe troubles shall revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. You shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. He was sick unto death. I think the psalmist that wrote this was on the brink of death. He was extremely sick. And he says, Lord, you've allowed this sickness into my life. So it's much like the previous psalm. And yet he, with faith, he says, you're going to revive me again. You're going to bring me up from the depths of the earth. And then he says, you're going to increase my greatness and you're going to comfort me on every side. I, I really like this. I think this is a word from the Lord for many here tonight who suffer. I don't know what you guys suffer. I know what I suffer. I've got a spinal injury that causes me great pain and keeps me up almost every single night. And sometimes I cry out to the Lord and I just say, is this ever going to go away? And, and Lord, I feel like this is going to take me out. I'm not going to be able to fulfill my call. Then I have days like today. Last night was one of the worst nights I've had in as long as I can remember. Almost no sleep, the most excruciating pain. And I got up and I was telling my wife, I feel hopeless. I'm just, I feel like this is never going to end. And then on the way to the gym and on the way to work, I was praying. And by the time I got here, I was so filled with excitement about my life and my future. I, I woke up this morning feeling like, I don't know if I can just even go on anymore. And a couple of hours later, I'm telling the Lord, you know, future vision. Lord, we want to we plant other churches. And Lord, we, we want to continue with missions. And we want to do this. And I, if you're in that place, if you're like, there's something going on in my life. And God has allowed this sickness, this trial, this trouble, whatever it is. Uh, I, I'm with you. I know what it feels like to have a bad day and just be like bummed out and Lord, I can't go on. Fight it and pray through it and look at this psalm. God, 
the, the psalmist says, Lord, you've allowed me to have these great and severe troubles, but you're going to revive me again. I felt like I got a revival this morning, a new excitement. So what about this physical problem? I'm going ahead with the plans that God has given me. I'm going to forge ahead. I'm going to hit the finish line at a full pace. How about you? What do you need to talk to tonight? And I don't, I don't want to get weird. This is not that word of faith weirdness. But what situation in your life do you need to just bring up before the Lord and say, Lord, you have given this to me, but you're going to revive me again. This is not unto death. You know, this is a Lazarus moment. I feel like something inside me died, but Lord, bring it back to life and let it move forward. Lord, I don't, I don't know, if, you know, to you if it's a physical thing, if it's an emotional thing, if it's a hurt, whatever it is, take it to the cross. Take it to the Lord and ask Him, revive me, Lord. Increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. And also, this is our response, and this is the end. We're going to pray. Worship team can start coming up. He says, also with the loot, I will praise you and your faithfulness, O God. This is cool. The psalmist is about to say that, that we're going to worship you with music in the midst of this terrible trial or whatever. But notice he, he begins to draw attention to three of God's attributes. First of all, he praises God. He says, I'm going to get out my lute. It's like a guitar, right? But he says, I'm going to draw attention to your faithfulness. Think about something tonight that God has been faithful to you in and just praise him as the worship team leads us. He says, to you I will sing with the harp, O holy one of Israel. Think about God's holiness. Think about God's holiness tonight and praise him for his holiness. He says, my lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing to you and my soul which you have redeemed. Check this out. His righteousness, his faithfulness, his holiness, his, I'm sorry, his redemption, and now his righteousness. My tongue also shall talk of your righteousness all the day long. As we sing this closing song, whatever's going on, whatever you're dealing with, whatever stresses, hurts, brokenness, bring it up before the Lord, but don't hesitate to praise him. Don't hold back and praise him for his faithfulness. Praise Him for His holiness. Praise Him that He saved you. Praise Him for His righteousness. And then this, it says, they are confounded, for they are brought to shame who seek my hurt. Uh, this is just what I see in that last verse. The world is filled with people who would love to see us just fail as Christians. I want to persecute you. I want to give you a hard time because I want to take you out of the race. And how cool is it when those people see you raising your hands to the Lord and worshiping and just saying, you know what? No matter what you throw at me, God is bigger and he will sustain me through it. Father, thank you for this night. Lord, these psalms are so empowering because they don't hide anything. David opens every psalm saying, ah, Lord, help. And he closes every psalm saying, God, you are the answer to everything and I'm rededicating myself to you. Lord, tonight we're responding to you for your faithfulness, for your holiness, for saving us and that you are righteous. And whatever you spoke to us tonight, Lord, we want to pray that it would be yes and amen as the Holy Spirit empowers us to fulfill whatever you've called us to walk forward in tonight, Lord. We love you. And we just want to yield our hurts, Lord. Emotional hurts, persecutions, physical hurts, sickness, disease. Lord, we pray that tonight would be a night of you comforting and healing, restoring. We look forward to when Jesus comes back and all things will be restored. Lord, just move in these last couple of minutes. Encourage us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's... 